So, hey guys, uh, I'm here with Ben Canute, uh, 2016 uh, US Olympian, second place over at 70.3 Worlds, multi-time winner at Escape from Alcatraz. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of recap from the uh, Bear Lake Brawl this past weekend, uh, kind of run through a little bit of his experience racing first time, I believe, in 2020, um, and, and get a dive a little bit into his experience come race day. So, how are you doing today, Ben? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Not too bad. Not too bad. Had a little bit of a uh, uh, busy weekend. We were shooting another course uh, for pro triathlon training. So super stoked about that. Nice. Yeah. So how was your, uh, you know, your experience uh, this past weekend you were racing over at Bear Lake Brawl. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I'd say going into it felt pretty good. Um, got the call to do the race about two and a half ish weeks um, before the race date. And uh, just tried to kind of get together and get in some a quick little 70.3 training and go see how I'd fare. Um, I guess like to put it short, like race was a bit of a de disaster for me. Um, but it was at least good to have the opportunity to go out on the race. Uh, and, you know, racing races like this, like kind of smaller, not championship races, they're kind of like pass fails. Um, they kind of see where I am and I get to see, okay, what's, I, I kind of get to go back and reaffirm like, what have I been working on? How does it translate to this distance? And with everything focused on challenge Daytona and the PTO championships in, in at that race, um, this was just kind of a good check mark to, to kind of reset for us. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of jumping back to that training, you know, leading into uh, you know, the Bear Lake Brawl, how was, you know, what did that look like? Um, you know, you, you said you had roughly two weeks. Was the focus to really try to like jump in and do, you know, some distance or was it, you know, primarily focused on like a little bit more intensity? So I think most of this year, um, after the beginning of the year where we were ready to jump into races in like March and April, uh, and kind of held that fitness for a while, we then reset and we started refocusing and working on, I'd say more like threshold running. So yeah. maybe more like three K ish, um, especially with Tokyo next year. So just some like higher end running and we pulled back on the swim and the bike and the volume overall. So um, I obviously still had some good fitness. I raced pretty well in the Zwift series at the last one, but um, did a little bit of like the, the super league series. So was doing like these little races, the VRs like uh, for Ironman, like had a little bit of good checkpoints along the way, but we kind of took this focus of just working on intensity running and not really doing the strength or endurance that's needed for half Ironman. So once we got that, we were like, well, you know, not many opportunities in 2020 to race. Like we got to throw our hat in the ring and just see where we're at. And with that couple of weeks, we thought, okay, maybe we found a little something here that we could um, go out there and be competitive. But um, with it being 6,000 feet, uh, with the guys who are there having put in like tons of big miles from what it looks like, um, and then just with the cold and being in the heat and summer in Phoenix all along, just like nothing really came together overall. And that bit of training that I did beforehand probably prepped me to survive the distance, but not be ultra competitive at it. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, you know, definitely an off year, obviously for everybody. So, you know, we're just trying to end up getting to these races with, you know, the best result possible. Right. Um, you know, so I guess let's talk like a little bit about the, the traveling to the race. You know, I, I think it's, you know, I think it was a little bit of a unique situation for everybody. Um, was there a little bit of hesitancy flying out there? Would you like, were you like in this situation, if everything was normal, would you have flown out there or would you have driven? Um, if I, if there wasn't any pandemic or anything yeah. like that, like usually I fly to a race, like kind of shorten it, but you know, there's something to be said for driving to a race. Um, it was about 12 hours and that's right about on the edge of that circle that we draw around saying like, okay, this is about how far we would go. Yeah. Um, if it was a normal year and we had to drive to a race like that, I might've stayed out at the race site a little bit longer. Um, but just with everything going on, driving was super easy. We could pack up the truck and just head out there and enjoy getting out of the heat of Phoenix for a bit and training at Bear Lake. 
Uh, that's awesome. And you, so you guys went out there, I think, roughly a week early, right? Um, a little bit less. We drove out Tuesday, and that took most of the day. So we basically had Wednesday, Thursday, Friday there before the race. Is that typically standard, like, for you when you're traveling to, like, let's say just, like, a domestic race is, like, roughly, like, a week, you know, four days, like, a normal time frame for you guys? A week would probably be the most. Um, when, it, when you can fly, like, you can kind of – it takes a little bit less out of you than sitting, like, all day. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it really depends on the times. Of domestic races, usually I fly and fly out pretty quick. I'll have – um, a couple of days uh, with a race like this in Bear Lake, like it's good training up there. Um, so you don't really lose anything. But if you're flying to a place like New York City, um, that you kind of cut it a little bit closer just because you can you can't really get in any real quality work while you're yeah. there. So basically, that if you're racing Saturday, you fly in, you know, Thursday or Wednesday evening, rest and sharpen up for two days race and then head out. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Was so was like altitude like a driver of that decision at all? Or, you know, was it just like, hey, I want to get out there, enjoy a little bit of the training, um, you know, get the lay of the land? Or, you know, was... Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I think that overall with this race, like it was more of just going out and getting a checkpoint, just like giving it a shot, just seeing it was either going to go really well or not. So it was getting out there with enough time where it made like financial sense and also just to get in the structure and it was only open water swimming no real pools so didn't want to go out too early um but like i i think that the altitude like it was just always going to be there there's no real way to prepare coming from sea level unless i went up a few weeks beforehand yeah. or unless i was getting in like a day or two before the race um i think you know traditionally that's the best way to deal with it um I actually, I think that I usually do better in altitude than heat, surprisingly enough. Yeah. Uh, whenever I go up to Denver or, you know, Flagstaff here, it's, I usually end up having some pretty good workouts, but I think like what you can see from the race, um, the altitude never really got a chance to, to really hurt me. Cause I just don't think aerobically I was that stressed yep. overall, like, I wasn't feeling like my legs were good and my lungs were bad. It was more the opposite. Like, even if there was some breathing hard, it was more like, I feel like my legs should be working harder than this. So it was just one of those things where, yeah, I think it was more of a, a strength endurance aspect. And we just, um, yeah, I think that the altitude maybe was just a periphery thing for us just kind of adding to that. Yeah, no doubt. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think I'm a little bit like you in that regard, uh, definitely perform a little bit better at altitude, um, you know, than, you know, having to bear the heat, I would say. Um, so, you know, you head out there, uh, did you guys, I saw a lot of people were camping out there. Is that something that you guys chose? Um, were there any hotels in the area or was it just kind of like a big party out there? It's a pretty small town. So the lodging was kind of hard to find. And we're also traveling with our dog. So that kind of narrowed in a lot of the, it ruled out a lot of the places that we could stay. But my wife is seven months pregnant now. Yeah. So camping wasn't really an option for us. We wanted to make sure we had a bed, AC, um, good bathrooms and everything. So um, yeah, and usually like if I have the opportunity, like camping is not necessarily bad, I guess. But um, I think for us, like it's just, it's a little bit of a comfort security thing to be able to find uh a little place to stay and um, we were at, we got lucky and we were able to find a condo that was relatively close and uh, snag that as fast as we could. Yeah, I, you know, I was kind of rolling into the question next of like, you know, is it optimal really to camp before a race like that? You know, like I was taking a look at some of the weather statistics, you know, leading into the race and it looked like it was like in the high 80s, mid to high 80s, you know, and, and not having access to AC or not having, you know, that, that ability to just like get inside and cool down you know, could potentially, you know, if you're not smart about it, impact results from a race, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. Having AC, having a, a soft bed and everything is good. I think you can, um, get pretty creative with the camping and probably have a good setup. Um, I think when, in that race, there are some people camping like basically on the start line. So, uh, we drove 25 minutes to the start. So there are trade-offs to everything that you do. It's just basically finding, um, what works best for yourself, what's, um, 
what kind of you would prefer, what, what gives you the most confidence going into the race, what makes you most comfortable? Yeah, most definitely. So, you know, you like leading into race, race day, like the training that you were doing, um, you know, all the way up to basically Friday at that point, you know, did you feel confident? Did you feel comfortable? Was there any indication, you know, of, of kind of what lied ahead um, come race day? Yeah, you know, in my workouts, um, I knew my cycling watts were not going to be as high as they would be for some of the other halves that I've gone into, um, just because of the the train, the way that we've done training recently. We put a lot of focus on the run. I knew that my run, like if I came off the bike um, in decent position or something, I knew that my run is really good right now. Um, so I felt pretty confident in that and. I mean, the swim, I just, I can always kind of rely on my swim, even though the swim training has been suboptimal this year. Like it, it usually comes back relatively quick. And yeah. um, I felt confident enough in that, especially when I got there and I started swimming in the lake. I just loved that lake and swimming and it was, it was great. And swimming in my wetsuit was great too. So um, I felt pretty confident about the swim and the, the run. Um which is kind of funny because I think a lot of times I, I rely on the bike and yeah. I'm really confident in the bike. So that was always kind of the biggest question mark just with the work that we put in um, and how I'd be feeling um, after like a swim race pace effort. Um, so some of the workouts going in there, it was kind of 50, 50. I had some really good ones. I had some ones that weren't great and just had to kind of grit through it. Um, so I mean, on the start line, yeah, I felt confident that I could be competitive. <clears throat> um, but I think there, there's also a little bit like, I just knew that it, it wasn't optimal. So I felt as confident as I could, I guess, yeah. on that start line. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's great. And that's like, anytime you toe the line, you want to get out there and be co as confident as you could possibly be and rely on your training. So, um, you know, let's, let's walk through the swim a little bit. You know, you, you guys obviously had a little bit of a delay uh, it was pretty choppy out there, I would assume, because uh, of the wind. Yeah, so um, the race director did a good job just getting us in the water and, and finding a solution pretty quickly because when we first got out there uh, and the Ironman athletes ahead of us weren't off, um, I think there was some concern because one of the buoys was just blowing away, um, and they ended up not using that one at all. I couldn't get it anchored. So oh, wow. uh, we ended up swimming three laps of just back and forth, um which made for a pretty chaotic swim yeah um it, it was relatively shallow and i think some of the guys were standing up or something like that like and there were age groupers who were just kind of walking through um and it was kind of like an obstacle course so definitely a chaotic swim and one that you know i you know, we went off in a uh, kind of staggered start and yep. i basically just put my head down and made it to the front of the group as fast as possible and then fell into a rhythm and just kind of thought about getting through the swim because it was really choppy in one direction and then it was pretty cruisy in the other direction with the wind being at your back. Um, and I just kind of, you know, let myself fall into a pace, just worked on making it through one lap at a time, not running into anybody head on and kind of weaving through people. Um, so definitely one of the more unique swims I've done. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, I would assume, how many people, do you know how many people overall uh, ran the race? Uh, so they had uh, four different distances, sprint Olympic. I think they even had a quathlon and half and uh, Ironman. So there are a lot of different distances and people spread out among those. But the, the race itself with all the participants was capped at 500. Okay. So not, not terribly, you know, not a terrible amount, but you no. know, you were swimming with pretty much aside from the Ironman athletes, you were swimming with everybody else, right? With all the half athletes, I think they waited to send the sprint and Olympic off a little bit later for us to be cleared of the water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was still, it was quite a few athletes who were around. Do you have any like strategies for like when you encounter races like that, where you have to maybe swim over or swim with age groupers? It's pretty rare for that to happen. And even yeah. in this case, um, this is this is a pretty unique case probably because of the conditions. Um, I Usually they send the pros off relatively early and you don't have to navigate as yeah. much. For myself, um, if I'm swimming in a race with other people or I find myself in the middle of a pack, especially like an ITU swim, um, I try and find clear water as much as possible. 
or just take breaks in kind of the quiet sections, like in between people's hips or, or areas like that where you won't get dunked or you're not like constantly fighting somebody. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so did you, going into it, uh, you were obviously leading the swim for quite some time and you were, I believe you were first out of the water, right? Yeah. Um, did you, like, was there anybody nearby? Were you working with anybody? Um, you know, was there a strategy beforehand going into it or were you just saying, Hey, I want to get out of the water first. That's my goal. That's what I'm going for. That's usually what I do. And the, the game plan had to kind of shift, um, as we went into it. Uh, we were supposed to be sent off 10 seconds apart, but the timing company did us about like four or five seconds. And I mean, at that point, like I knew that I could be near the front. So I just swam to, to get to the front and just decided to, to see how that would pan out. I don't think that I, you know, put down anything spectacular or like really thought that I could get super far ahead like with the swim fitness I had I just knew that I could kind of come out of the water first and I think Bradley Weiss was somewhat around me for for a lot of the swim that we had all the same colored caps so I I saw there was somebody with me and he was second out of the water um just a bit back by the end of it um so I knew that he was somebody was a little bit around me and I was just kind of trying to set myself up for the best race possible and just get that section done and on to the next one. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so coming out of the water and heading into T1, were you feeling good? Were you feeling strong, confident that the bike was going to go as, as well as your training had allowed? Yeah, um, I felt good at that point because I was able to, to get out front and like racing from the front. Um, got out of transition one. All right. I was a little bit uh, slow. I think I, was, I wasn't quite as sharp. Um, in a lot of things through here, but I think some of that just had to deal with the cold, but T1 was relatively smooth, got my stuff, got out of there and started on the bike and just tried to settle in. Um, I think I, and probably Brad behind me, uh, had to deal with some cows that were on the road. So I had to holler at some of them to like, make sure I could get through. Um, that was just kind of funny. Just, you know, something that it was no real issue. Just kind of um, made sure that I wasn't going to get bucked off the bike oh, um, by a, a stray cow. But, um, <laughs> and then I just got in and I, you know, I never, usually when I go, like I, I can get in, find a really good rhythm, push pretty early, never quite found that rhythm, kind of struggled to find the pace, found myself either pushing too hard or not hard enough and not really in the sweet spot. Um, which that was fine. And, you know, Brad was right with me and we just, uh, I just kind of waved him up and we took turns setting the pace for a little bit. Um, but yeah, then Sam caught us pretty quick on. And, um, from that point I was just kind of in damage control mode and yeah. was just trying to make it through. I could tell that I was a bit more stiff than I probably should have been, um, throughout that bike ride. Um, just trying to, uh, yeah, get comfortable in the position, probably not enough hours in that. Um, and then a second group came by and uh, pretty soon after that was when the rain happened. And once I started just getting like super, super cold. Yeah. Uh, that's so I guess what mile did you kind of like realize like, Hey, this, you know, this just doesn't feel right. This isn't, you know, things just aren't working right now. Uh, well, I tried to keep those thoughts at bay for as long as possible. Yeah. Um, I definitely kind of, I knew we were flying. Like we had the wind at our back and we were going, we we're averaging like well over 30 miles an hour on the way out, which wow. was fun. Like it's fun to ride that fast. Um, but I also kind of knew like doesn't quite feel uh, exactly right uh, here, but I just kept saying like, just keep making it from one checkpoint to another, keep taking in your nutrition. Like it's a really long race. Like you got to keep trying to stay in it. And even when I got past that point, like, you know, uh, around the halfway point or whenever, when I started struggling, um, I still was just saying to myself, like, just keep taking what your body gives you and just keep trying to push, uh, towards your limit and limit any damage that's ahead. Cause you still have a half marathon to run. Yeah, most definitely. And that's, it's just interesting to get a little bit of insight into the mentality of like, everybody goes through, you know, obviously these ups and downs, you know, through a race. And it's interesting to get a little bit of insight you know, to, to where your head's at, you know, like there's always the opportunity to have, 
you know, to, to pick it back up. You're right. Like you have a 13 mile run on the back end and things can change like in an instant. Um, yeah. And you see that very frequently with, you know, long course races. So um, yeah, so you, you're heading not, you know, you're fin- finishing off the bike. Uh, where did you guys, where did you end up finishing on the bike, uh, getting off the bike? Uh, you know, I think I, I was well back. I think Sam might've been six minutes ahead of me at that point. And uh, the group was a couple minutes behind him or something like that. But frankly, like even with like 20 miles to go, I was starting to shiver and I'd never shivered on the bike before. Yeah. Um, so while my leg, like, well, before that, even though I knew that my legs weren't quite right at, at that point, like as it started to rain and I started to get colder and colder, especially that last five miles, all I was thinking about is just getting off the bike um, just to get warm. I didn't even really care about anything wow. else. I just wanted to like be warm. Um, and that T2 is a disaster. Like my dismount, um, it's not unusual for me, like putting my leg over my saddle to get like a little bit of a twitchy hamstring. Uh, and just that's, I, I can feel it kind of going. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do a flying dismount because I can't feel my feet and my hamstrings uh, definitely going to be a little bit twitchy here. But uh, yeah, just full on cramps, which has never really happened and had to like wow. fix that before going on. Um, and then I was just cold, like my hands and everything weren't working well. So like putting my feet in my shoes, I'm buckling my helmet. Um, and basically I took a pretty long T2 uh, for myself, which usually I'm like in and out. Uh, I tend to take transitions like an ITU race, like just spend as little time in there as possible. Um, but was in there for like a couple minutes and basically just like made sure I got myself, I put on a jacket and then just started running uh, just to get warm. So um, it definitely took a few miles to do that. But um, yeah, just, I, I figured like I've had a couple bad bike workouts, but ran well off of those. So thought yep. that maybe I could pull something together, but just wasn't, wasn't meant to be on the day and just body kept going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So have, I mean, have you, have you raced in conditions very similar to that, you know, and, and yeah. not had a problem? Yeah, no, I've raced in cold races. Now, uh, comparing some of those other races in the, yeah, comparing some of those races in like to this one could be difficult. Like maybe this one was a bit colder or the yeah. wind a bit worse or something, but I raced Texas 70.3 in 2018 and won that. And it was cold and rainy, like had numb feet for the first lap of the run. Uh, I've raced in Stockholm when it's been cold and rainy and had one of my best WTS races early on uh, in that. And um, those are the first two that come to mind, but I've done it definitely before and actually always love racing in the rain (laughs) when it's cold. So I think that this time though, um, I haven't had any sort of cold weather in months. It's been like the coldest it gets here in Phoenix is like 70 or 80 and 70 would be like, it's like, uh, you know, I haven't seen that in a long time. Mainly like 80 is the overnight low. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that was some of it. And, you know, over the winter in Phoenix, it can get pretty chilly at night and that might help with some of those other races that where I did well. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it was a bit surprising for that to happen to me, but um, yeah, was, I definitely preferred, uh, I preferred racing in the rain in the past. Wow. That's surprising. Yeah. It, it's always interesting when, you know, you, you go in and you think you're, you're strong at this and, and, you know, you've performed very well in conditions, very similar to what you had troubles with. And, you know, it's always a little bit difficult to accept on that side is like, I know, I know it's like, uh, when that happened, you know, and you, you started feeling super chilly, the rain started happening, you were cramping a little bit. Did you kind of have like a game plan or like, maybe something that was going your, in your head to kind of like solve the problem. Did you try to like spin your legs a little bit more uh, to warm up, you know, like, or, or like, I guess I'm trying to understand like what was going through your head, like to find a solution potentially, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was just trying to like push kind of as hard as I could, which at that point wasn't very hard, but just to try and create some sort of body heat. Um, But really at that point, like it stopped turning, like it stopped being racing at that point on the bike and it was more just like get to the bike turnaround get in to transition like i i wasn't in arrow as much as i was before like i wasn't um like going like super fast like i was enjoying the hills actually because the hills slowed me down and it was only a really short section of hills too but like 
I was able to put out a little bit more power and not like have as much wind in my face. So that was a little bit nicer, but yeah, it was basically just like in the moment, like, trying to find ways to, to keep myself warm. And there wasn't really much I can do until I get up, could get off the bike. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, that's wow. I, I understand how you feel because there's, you know, very similar situation. I went out for a training ride up in Boulder um, and actually got rained on and ended up getting hypothermia. Um, so understand that like un uncontrollable, like shaking and like discomfort yeah. and cold and just like this desire to get off the bike and like try to find warmth in some way. Um, so you, you, you get into T1 uh, or T2, you know, you're ready to hop off the bike. You, you have a little bit, you know, a couple challenges dismounting. Um, you know, the race isn't going your way or as planned. Um, you know, kind of where do you go from there? You know, you hit the run. Do you feel confident on the run? Are you still like, hey, I can reel this in potentially with a solid run? Um, you know, where, what's your thoughts behind that? Yeah, I was just going to try and salvage something from the race. Like, yeah. I know that my run is, is pretty good right now. And um, I was just like, okay, well, I mean, let's try and go and have a good half marathon and uh, have something to show for it. You know, if somebody else up front, else if they're suffering from the cold too and they drop back or they paced it wrong or something, then I'll be there to, to pick up the slack. But um, early on, I had decent pace. But, <clears throat> I mean, I found out pretty quickly I was just going to be running to – to kind of finish and salvage what I could. Um, it kind of just was like stepping downstairs. Like I'd hold something for a little while and then the pace would get a little worse and I'd get stuck there. And um, yeah, it was just kind of uh, a case of just trying to get through in whatever way I could. Yeah. And I mean, obviously like mentally, this was a little bit of a challenge for you. Like at that point, like, you know, you know, what, what are, what are your thoughts? Like you're obviously walking yourself through this. Um, you know, you want to get to the finish line, regardless of the situation, you know, it's not a race anymore. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's really just salvaging and getting to the finish line. Like what, what are your thoughts? You know, like, is it, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, when like everybody has these funks, you know, and people sometimes, you know, just don't grasp that this happens to pros as well. Um, you know, like, and I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea of like your mentality behind this and like, regardless of the situation, like you were, you were finishing no matter what. And like that, like no matter the, the highs or the lows, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well this year, especially like this was the one race that I could potentially have. Um, I have like maybe one more or two more on the calendar, um, yeah. that will happen. And um, I wasn't going to drive all the way out to this race and waste the race director's time or anybody else by just stopping and not giving myself a chance. Um, I think that like, first off, like the pro triathlon organization, like putting up the prize money for that race was awesome for us pros. Yeah. And then really the race director too, taking us in and allowing us to be there. Like that's just extra stress added onto his plate and the way that he dealt with everything too um that's that that was i mean it, it would have been kind of just rough to yeah. to quit on that and not like respect the race a little bit um plus like i didn't want to have one of the only races of 2020 for myself um just being a dnf um and i knew that i wanted to give myself a shot it was an out and back half marathon so i kind of forced myself saying you know if you made it, like I, I knew that I wanted to at least warm up and see how I felt. And that took a few miles and I'm like, well, I might as well make it to the halfway point. And at that point, like, what am I going to do? Like stop and like hitch a ride back to the finish line. Like yeah. I'd rather walk than have to sit in that car and say like, Oh, it was only a few more miles or whatever. So there were still some ways to like salvage. Like I was still, you know, I got six. So there's still a little bit of prize money there. And yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to finish too and just have that and just say, okay, well, I, I gritted that out, even though it wasn't the fastest day. Like I'm not gonna, I guess the more you quit, the easier it becomes with that sort of thing. So I didn't want to have it be easier to quit any other day. No, that's I, like, I feel like somebody should like get a tattoo of that, you know, like that's like an amazing statement and I totally agree with you. Um, yeah. And you know, that's, 
it's amazing, you know, like what was put together by the PTO and then also the race director. Um, you know, something that honestly, I don't think anybody had any faith or belief that a single race would go through this year. Um, and having them pull through and really put something together, um, you know, both domestically and internationally has been, you know, amazing. And it's been like, it's been fun to watch the progress of this. Um, you know, and I, I think in the beginning there was, you know, a, a little bit of skepticism, you know, at least in, you know, with some people that I've talked about, but to actually watch the development of the PTO and the follow through and, you know, the, having them build up, you know, the, the pros, um, has been fun to watch, you know? Yeah. Um, so you got through, um, you ended up finishing six. That's right. Yeah. Um, obviously not the day that you wanted, but again, I think, you know, fit any finish line at this point in time is an amazing finish line. Um, you know, what's, what's the focus from here? You touched upon, you know, a training camp, uh, and then heading to challenge Daytona. That's it. Challenge Daytona has been circled on my calendar since before everything happened. Yeah. So, um, oh, we got like 11 weeks until then. That's, mm -hmm. uh, I do well when I have a focused training block. So it's just going to be trying to set myself up to have the best race possible there. And, um, yeah, if anything, this has uh, got me up off my ass a little bit and make sure that I'm ready and don't leave any stone unturned. That's awesome, man. Um, uh, you know, heading out to training camp or what's the focus really on training? Is it more building a little bit of that volume, that strength and stamina, um, and, and the focus on the bike? Yeah. I mean, I just think overall building strength and endurance and just doing a lot of specific 70.3 work overall. So we've had a lot of success at the distance in the past and really it's just tapping back into, you know, what worked for me before um, some of those 70.3 wins and podium performances. Excellent, man. Well, you know, that's, we're coming up on the time here now. Um, I truly, truly, truly appreciate you taking the time to speak and, you know, recapping the race, uh, your experience. Um, you know, while it may not have been the result, you know, that you wanted to take away at the end of the day, there's like, I think there's always benefit. And I think you said this, you know, there's, there's always a lot to learn regardless of the situation, whether you win or whether you lose. And like what I was trying to share today, and I hope we, you know, hope came across was, you know, not every experience is a great experience, but, you know, there's an opportunity to learn. And what I was hoping to get across was, you know, some of those learning moments and learning experiences for athletes out there in the world, um, you know, who could, who could truly find like a relatable experience to yours and say, hey, I'm not the only one out there. Um, you know, top athletes run through these situations on a regular basis. They're able to tackle it and, you know, get over that adversity, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, I appreciate your time. I'm wishing you the best, uh, you know, training into Challenge Daytona, uh, also the training camp as well. Um, anything else that you'd like to add? No, I mean, that was good. That was it. Um, I think that you covered it all. I think it's, yeah, like you said, like I learn more from my failures than I do my successes. And, um, you know, successes after failures always taste a little bit sweeter. Mm -hmm.